Welcome to episode 68 of the Hard Truth About B2B E-Commerce. I'm your co-host, Isaiah, and I'm here with uh, Tim and our awesome repeat guest that you'll get into, Tim. <laughs> hey, uh, hi, everyone. It's Timothy Peterson. Welcome back uh, to another great episode of the Hard Truth About B2B E-Commerce. Uh, before I introduce our guest, let me pause for a message from our amazing sponsors. Our first sponsor is Punch Out To Go. Punch Out To Go is a global B2B integration company specializing in connecting commerce business platforms with e-procurement and ERP applications. Punch Out To Go's iPass technology seamlessly links business applications to automate the flow of purchasing data. With their solution, you can immediately reduce integration complexities for punch out catalogs, electronic purchase orders, invoices and other B2B sales order automation documents in order to accelerate business results. Balance is our other sponsor. Balance is a B2B e-commerce payment solution that works well for you and your buyers. It offers a seamless one-click checkout for almost any payment method, including ACH, wire, checks, cards, even terms. It's used by leaders in B2B e-commerce, and it's as easy as buying a shirt from Amazon. Check them out at getbalance.com, book a session, and tell them what your needs are. They are the first dedicated payment platform for B2B e-commerce, 100% tailored to your needs. Thanks again to our sponsor, Balance. Okay, everyone, uh, please uh, check out our sponsors. They are remarkable folks who have been with us for quite a ride uh, for a very long time. Uh, and let me just give a quick intro to our guest, Paul DeForno at Deloitte, uh, I believe head of content and commerce. Is that uh, your, uh, what you're managing director of, Paul, at this time? That's correct. Yeah, and uh, let me just throw this out there to remind our listeners as well. I think Paul and I first met about 20 years ago. <laughs> uh, I think you got into Deloitte at around 2000, 2001. I was uh, at a startup uh, called Prefer, which ended up getting acquired by Merkel. We actually had uh, clients in common and worked on some things together. So it's been quite a long journey for us. Uh, and we still look the same, right? We still look exactly <laughs> the same, no different. You know? so, <laughs> welcome back, Paul. Uh, please tell us more. And uh, maybe you could dive in a little bit onto what you've been up to and, and thanks again for being a repeat guest we don't do this too often but you've got a lot of great stuff going on so we want to give you uh, a nice chunk of time today to update our listeners well i can confirm i am an old guy uh, <laughs> <laughs> i have been around for uh, many a year and so we, we've seen all these waves of commerce and you know early in my career i started more in the b2c side and over the last couple of years, I actually am now leading the B2B commerce practice at Deloitte Digital. And Deloitte Digital is the largest uh, North American commerce SI out there. And we serve some of the largest clients, everything from design, build to operate, you know, pretty big brands that you would recognize. But today, you know, I'd like to talk, you know, about B2B and, and I love this uh, podcast. And, and one of the things that, especially as we talk about what's critical about B2B commerce, sometimes it's just semantics. Um, and especially at large uh, companies, you know, what exactly is B2B commerce? Because sometimes people have a perspective, B2B commerce, oh, that's just, uh, you know, direct on the uh, e-commerce channel, on the web channel. And we, especially for B2B companies, we, we like to look at actually, I, I try to broaden the term. We're now using the term omni-channel B2B commerce to, because there's actually lots of different ways that are semantically, sometimes people call them, may call them B2B commerce, may come not. So, uh, you know, I, I'd like to talk about those channels so that when we're talking about this, we're all kind of talking the same language. So, you know, First of all, you know, the most direct is like, you know, self-service web and mobile sites, right? And that's 
That's, you know, company selling to other companies. That's probably what most people associate with it. Well, we like to also talk about how B2B commerce is really all things digital in B2B sales. And I'm going to say that again, because it's an important, because this really helps change the way you think about B2B mm-hmm. commerce. It's all things digital that makes the selling process from one company to another easier. So if you go with that definition, you know, if you're selling on a marketplace, your own marketplace, third mm. party, third party marketplaces, mm-hmm. if you're calling into a call center, sales assisted, all of this commerce helps to, you know, support that. And even in, in addition to things such as punch out, you know, being able to sell via Ariba or Coupa on procurement systems where they jump out to your B2B system. So all of these different ways, and I have a feeling there'll be new innovative ways, innovative networks, and it'll continue to expand. And so it's an important to understand how you can digitally help sell uh, for from selling from one business to another. So we try and keep a broader definition because we're really in the in the business of growth and also making it easier to do business with. And so that, that's kind of our perspective when we look at the B2B business. Yeah, I think that B2B commerce is, yeah, it gets siloed too much where it's like, oh, like we need to build this thing that people will go on and buy without talking to a human. But it's like B2B is just so much more complex than that. It could be a multi-step sale. Um, there, there's just so many ways that they may interact with a business, but it's more and more digital, right? Or the, cons- the business buyer wants that digital aspect more and more, whether it's just looking at product data, requesting a quote, tracking order, you know, seeing the order status, you know what I mean? Like, and I think that like by looking at it as more of like an assisted sale, like the, I like that term assisted sale. That's where I think a, almost a better way to look at the value yeah. of it. And that's why I think B2B com- commerce never gets to the right level because especially we see this, we're more on the SMB side than you guys are. They're just like, well, we only do a million dollars on the site. So we're only going to invest, you know, 2% in our revenue because they look at it as this silo of it's this little chunk of revenue for the business. And they don't think about like, well, maybe it contributed to the an additional 30 million of an assisted sales via product data or whatever, you know, the other things that you're talking about. Yeah. Hey, one, one thing I'll bring up too, because, uh, you know, I used to use the term omni-channel a lot for B2C, right? For, you know, retail and e-commerce and catalog and call center. And it's like, well, those are the channels. And what's interesting is that I think it's gotten to the point where a lot of people are not using omni-channel for B2C. And it makes a lot of sense to use it for B2B. It's kind of just a different stage. I'm hearing more in B2C now where people talk about convergence, you know, or they talk about harmonization, you know, instead of talking about the channels because they've already, you know, achieved a certain level, right? Where they've gotten to this point where it's like, okay, you know, we've gotten gotten here and now what's next? All right, we have to make sure that all of these processes converge and that the consumer, the end consumer has a harmonized experience. And it's, and I, but I, I totally agree with you on this for B2B, it needs to have omni-channel first. It needs to talk about that. So it needs to break it all down. How, how do you, maybe, is there a way that you guys might help a business quantify this or think about this more holistically so that they're investing in it the right way like how do they quantify the assisted sale i mean some things are more easy to quantify right like potentially marketplace sales but is there a way that you guys are going about this where it's like hey look like all these sales are coming through this digital aspect Uh, yeah so so a couple things and and actually i'd start with the first thing because one of the things that i hear a lot of especially as you know, different companies try to help B2B companies. You, you know, the first thing that they might say is, oh, we're just going to provide a B2C like experience into your B2B. And I'm like, no, no, that's such a naive understanding of how large companies sell, right? 
And the first thing you want to start with, and, and I'll get to your question, is understanding the broad set of personas you have to deal with. Okay. And so when you're dealing, it's not just a consumer that's going to make the decision and hit the button and buy. You might have to have 20 conversations, deal with the sales manager, deal with the sales rep, a field salesperson, like all the different types of people yeah. who are part of the complex uh, buying process. And so when you're looking to solve for it, you need to think about all the different ways that you need to empower a company to be able to sell. And so, you know, to your question of everything that is manual and, you know, by the last estimates from Digital Commerce 360, you know, $17 trillion of B2B payments were done. Over half of them are still done manually, right? And so how you start to articulate how people are getting paid, either via wires, via manually, and, and that all those manual tasks, that's, that's the opportunity here is how do you make it easier to do business with? And in many ways, it's not B2B commerce and this omni-channel piece it's not just only about the transaction and the buying, right? It's about how do you make it easy? Hey, what's the order status, right? Mm -hmm. When can yeah. I print my, sure. mm -hmm. print my invoice? All of those things are the things that really drive and make it easier. So there's both a revenue side increase and there's a cost side takeout uh, from the digital technology. Mm. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense. And I think that's where it's, it's, it, yeah, you have to be thinking about the customer experience, right? How do we elevate the customer experience? Do you think that some of that is, you think more and more companies are starting to recognize that it's like, hey, we absolutely need to do this digitally, or there's still resistance because the sales reps or the culture of the company wants to hold on to those relationships and not kind of as you say, almost automate some of these things going from manual to automated. You see, are you still seeing some of that resistance? Um, there, there, there's going to be classic resistance, but I'll, I'll use this example at, um, I was just in a workshop with, you know, a multi-billion dollar chemical company and the president was sitting there and actually we brought one of our strategists with it and she's a little younger, she's a millennial and um, we brought up the example of, hey, she likes to interact more via text, right? And we were going through some of the trends and everything that was going on, but she used that in the context of the follow-ups and being able to digitally. Mm -hmm. And what was interesting is the executives just clicked in their head because one of the things that they're struggling with and this is a, a new driver for this is getting people, right? And the people that they have to attract are millennials, are who, who are the largest part of the workforce right now. And so she, in a, a thing in her head just went off and she's like, this B2B commerce uh, growth capability, it's not just for the, the sales helping, it's also we need to retain and leverage our you know, new employees. And so it's also a workforce development initiative. And so she, that just like her seeing, hearing that from, uh, you know, somebody that's younger and very professional and what they're used to, what their norms are, just turned on that light. And I think we're going to see that more and more, especially as executives, uh, you know, move up. Well, yeah. let me, yeah, let me just interject on that. I mean, one of the things that came up in, in conversations in the last couple of weeks with some folks, uh, you know, I work with is, you know, they're, they're uh, putting like live chats on their B2B sites, right? Yeah. Which was really unheard of just even a few years ago. It's like, uh, you know, click to calls and live chats uh, to find out more about a SaaS solution, right? Or to, to get a demo or to whatever. And, and it's so sensible. It really is such an easy thing to do. It's not, it, it's not hard, right? I mean, it's really not hard. And it's amazing that it took so long, but now it's like, that's what I want to do. I don't want to fill out 
an inquiry form and type in like who I am and you know all this stuff. I don't want that. I don't want that either. I want to and then wait like three days to hear back from someone oh, and they're like, oh my God. "Who are you?" And it's like this whole process. Yeah, yeah it, you, no one, no one really wants that anymore. I mean, you don't even have to be millennial or Gen Z for for to say, "Oh my well, God." Let, let's go back. I mean, I actually think this is a really important point. The millennial Gen yeah. Z. I think people still forget. It's like, oh, millennial Gen Z, like. Or, but also Gen X, like the 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 older millennials, like they're not that young. They're 35, 36, 37. It depends on like the exact year. You're yeah. talking about people, millennials that are going to be 40 years old in like the next year or two, I think, whatever the cutoff is. Mm -hmm. And then the generation slightly above, like those guys still grew up with like Nintendo and like they're yeah. pretty like, like my, you know, uh, Gen X friends, like they're pretty like, on top of technology like you know maybe not quite the gen z level they're not necessarily on like TikTok, but like i mean they're buying everything through e-commerce like they're pretty like and these are like 40 year old you know mom well, and dads like and they're gonna be the like buyers and the procurement people you know what i mean it's like i think people forget it's like these people aren't like 20 years old <laughs> you know and, and, well, I'll, I'll let you dive in on this in a second paul but one bit of data that i've been like really loving for a while is that you know all of this like pew data and you know other really high quality stuff shows that you know people who are boomers also 55 plus uh, have adopted everything you know it, it didn't take that long and the 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 covid pandemic accelerated a lot of this because people you know, were at home more and they could dig into all sorts of technologies and social platforms and apps yeah. and tools that they didn't necessarily want to or have to or any of these other things before, but they do now, you know, the adoption is huge. So there's no excuse anymore is maybe the way I look at it, right? <laughs> well, yeah. as the resident Gen X, uh, whoever <laughs> always gets forgotten, <laughs> we are around here. And, uh, you know, I think we're a little bit more technical, but it is an important thing. I think the other part that it's not just some of the cultural things. The other thing that I've seen from a, a trend perspective of like hesitance to actually push stuff to B2B it is more of just the mindset around sales and under thinking that it really requires, well, we can't push things off. It requires that personal relationship because they've been doing it the same way for so long. And so getting over that hurdle is like one of the biggest and also aligning um, bonuses and their uh, comps so that they also get alignment. So a, a great example, um, one of the largest uh, technology firms that we're doing business with right now that helps automate um, plants and uh, IOT things, they actually just created a new role called a leader of digital sales, right? And to really drive more adoption. And part of that is not just the technology piece, but like, how do we set up new comps, new go-to-markets, new commercialization strategies so that people are taking advantage of these digital sales? And then in that digital sales, the other part, you know, going back to that omni-channel, they're also making sure that we they think more holistically of all of the marketplaces that are popping up. Should they participate? Should they build their own? Should they connect it, right? And how do they connect all of these different uh, selling ways? And then the hard part too is how do you keep pricing aligned? How do you keep you know, fulfillment visibility, especially in these days all together. And so this whole role, I anticipate seeing more and more of that um, as a way to, you know, in, in the future, they won't say digital sales, that'll just be inherent in all sales. But I, I think it was a really interesting um, mm. move by this it, company. It reminds me of like the sales ops roles in these SaaS companies, because yeah. sales is so complicated in some cases mm -hmm. and tracking everything. It's like sure. sales operations, digital sales. It's kind of like tracking this whole process that that isn't necessarily just one person to person. Um, I want to get it. So let's keep going through the team stuff a little bit. And then I want to get into some of the details because uh, I know you do have a, a hard stop. But um, 
like what are the people that and this is i mean one of the biggest problems we see is just like i'm dealing with some customers from like i just don't think they have the people and like it's almost like we feel like we're kind of set up to fail right because you know, we could try and help them, but if they don't have the people, it's like, it's just really hard to, to succeed, uh, you know, when you're doing these projects and, and kind of the outsourced, uh, you know, company. So what are the people that you look for, you expect, or maybe do you like tell clients like, Hey, you need this person. You need to go hire this person. Like, what are some of the key people that you kind of expect to work with in, you know, any organization for B2B commerce? Yeah. So I think first off, it's important to get a cross section. So if we're doing a large transformation and that's a lot of times what we get a part of, right? Instead of yeah. just being a one-off. Yeah. What's really important, we we like to have different types of, of skill sets. One, you know, bring us your best sales guy. In some ways, we want to understand what are what what are the ways what that they communicate, what are the important things, the insights, because in, in many ways, if there are things that you can pull out that they know what are the value uh, drivers, th those are the things that you want to enhance and how to play. So that helps in the whole design side of it, right? Um, second, it's also important for somebody from the sales org to be a part of uh, so that as you go through that whole change management, right? The ch I can't overemphasize how important, especially in the larger the company, the larger the importance of change management, of how to bring buy-in onto the different groups and have one teaching, but also have them give feedback so that before you go live, you're getting feedback. Well, we don't really do it. If you just tweak this, this would make it easier and bring them along. So, so if you don't think sales is in on board or involved, that's a red flag to you. Like if you're like, Hey, there's no salesperson, like, let's say you're in a meeting with yeah. you know, the executives and there's just like no sales guy. You're like, well, what's, is that like where you'd yeah, be like, we, well, who's the sales guy? Who's doing the sales here? Or like, well, what would yeah. you do? I guess is what I'm asking. <laughs> yeah. I, I mean, if you don't have a, any kind of person from the sa the actual sales organization and best practices have like one uh, a business product owner from the sales organization. And then two, you know, depending on the size of the project and regional is having somebody who is on the front lines to get like the voice of the customer. Cause yeah. the voice of the customer here is also the voice of the salespeople are so important. Yeah. They're going to be the ones mostly leveraging some of the tools. Mm. Okay. So you were like, we need these people <laughs> in these meetings and yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Much more so than, you know, even the technology, you know, cause, cause a lot of the technology, if you can get the business understanding, the product owners to be aligned around decisions, the technology is, is mostly straightforward. Mm. So, so Paul, one of uh, the experiences I've had, and, you know, I've worked with, let's say, more SMBs than I do enterprise. So probably there's some overlap, but not really exactly the, the multi-billion dollar chemical companies and stuff. But what we do is we usually title it something like an innovation working group, right? Or, mm -hmm. you know, or whatever. It's something that has a nice funky title to it. And we throw people into it, including exactly as you're saying, like people who are customer facing. And what I've seen happen is that people will hear that this is, is taking place, they wanna be part of it, and they'll come with documents, literally documents and say, here are the 24 things that I'm hoping we can do, or, you know, or things that I would like to see discussed. It's really extraordinary to me that in the last few years, people are that prepared and they know that there's that much catch up to do. Does that really happen in your kind of groups as well? Or is it really more of an SMB kind of thing? Oh yeah, I mean, <laughs> you get everything from, oh my God, we've been waiting forever. Yeah. You know, we finally got it through the funding life cycle that we got this project that they're just dying um, to, to get going. Um, and, and so, these days, especially, you're getting like that much more of an adoption because we've seen, especially with the COVID, it actually has uh, so many people have retired mm -hmm. that people yeah. have popped up and like, I need the tools. 
to, mm. to support them. And, and some of that is to automate because they don't have enough people. And so part of that automation helps to, you know, helps to balance out, you, you know, stretching uh, as far as they can. So is it fair to say, just to summarize the people, I really appreciate how you, you really highlight the sales roles and how critical mm -hmm. that is. Um, but I also find, because we work in smaller orgs that they kind of fall down on the IT side, um, cause you probably the orgs you guys work with might have stronger ITs. Some of ours do, we do work with some larger companies, but on the smaller side, we see these weird gaps where they might have sales, but no it or it and no marketing and sales. And it's like, they're just limited. It feels like you kind of need this balance of like some sales voice, but also, you know, someone that's an it product kind of some technical know-how to deal with the project management and the complexity of these these oh, yeah, development yeah, sure. projects and and kind of almost those two and a little bit of operations those kind of skill sets need to kind of come together in a line is that a fair it, it could be a yeah. few different people in departments is that a fair yeah 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 for sure the the biggest need i think from the it side that we look for and again we'll get everything across the board right like you know people lacking or people you know a lot of people retired and they don't have it but you know, if I look at the data, right, and the cleanliness of data and all the different data sources, like especially, you know, recent clients that we're working with have just done lots of acquisitions. So you have like three or four acquisitions on three or four sales. Uh, ERPs and three okay, ERPs. So three different ERPs. And so <laughs> oh, man. That, that, that ends up being the complexity of like, okay, yeah. how do we get how do we bring all that data? How do we cleanse it down? Like data cleansing this on the technical side is probably the number one challenge across the board. Who do you think is well suited for that? Because it's it's a tough, the reason I think people struggle with that is because it's like, well, it's sort of IT, but it's not exactly IT because sometimes it's like a business decision and it's almost like a marketing decision. It's like a multi-department, multi-skill set to kind of like, you know, the data science side and the, the, the IT side, but then also like there's business decisions as to like how to simplify the data, right? Would you, and that's where I think people struggle. It's like, it's not one skill set, right? Yeah, it, it's, uh, that, that's a really hard one. You're getting people <laughs> finance, you're getting people in op sales operations, all the different operations, right? Like, and being able to map that on, and especially in acquisitions, Hey, those groups don't exist anymore. And so that whole data, you know, you could do a whole podcast just on, <laughs> you know, how to clean data. I, I would love to. I used to do data a lot. I was a cognitive data so head of sales, actually, at one point. So if you know Galaxy, I sort of part yeah. of Merkle. So that was my world for a while. And data cleansing is, oh my God, it really is exactly so, what Isaiah said. It's, it's so astounding. Because data is such a big challenge in, in B2B and we'll, we'll probably, like you said, <laughs> maybe we'll, we'll have you back on and let's just do like, literally, let's do a data episode. We'll talk let's about pro it. product data, customer <laughs> data, but like literally we'll do it. We can do an entire episode on that. So it sounds like what you're saying is that you need people that are capable of, of the data side, not just IT, but holistically understanding the data that goes into IT to work with sales. And that's, you know, it kind of probably depends on the org and who those people are and the size, but that's, I think that's a really good point because it's like, it's almost more than just IT. It's like IT plus data. Right. Yep. And then, yep. so let's say you got all that. Let's say you, <laughs> you got it. it's like no one ever really does, but like, let's just say, you know, you sales it. is bought in, you've got your IT guy, you got <laughs> some data help, you, you know, you got some of these pieces. I think you brought up and I want to talk a little bit about agile and, and these systems. Seems like people are starting to realize like, hey, we got to do this faster. We can't wait two years for the ERP upgrade and then do the design and then do the development. It's all of a sudden you're three years into the project and the whole market has shifted and you're, you know, two years behind someone that did it in one year. So like you mentioned, uh, you know, before we started that the people are starting to kind of realize, you know, they got to go a little bit faster. And I couldn't agree. I, that's my biggest gripe. And why I started this podcast is I'm like, B2B is just moving too slow. And what worries me is like half these companies are going to like family owned out of business in 10 years because 
Amazon's going to automate everything. And they're just, you know what I mean? It's like, they're just, gonna, if you can move so slow in tech, right? So what do you, what do you recommend once they've figured out the people side or? Yeah, so th this is really interesting. And this is something over the last year has just accelerated for me, some very large deals that we've been part of. And if you look traditionally, you know, the largest ERP maker out there, SAP, they're in a massive upgrade um, uh, wave right now going to S4. Mm -hmm. um, and so- Is that the cloud or is that from the, the premise to cloud or it's just the S4 upgrade or- um, so Mostly uh, premise to cloud, but some of them are in cloud. So it's a little bit different, but it's an upgrade. It's a new version. Yeah. And so, and new, it, it's a massive change and it's a massive investment. Yeah. And so what we're seeing more and more is, well, they're going to the board because it's, you know, sometimes 50, hundred million dollar programs wow. that wow. are being set out. And so at that wow. point, you know, the sales guys in the front office are like, well, what about the tools for us? Yeah, you're like, right? we're not going to wait for a hundred million dollar like project to like improve sales. <laughs> right. So <laughs> what we've actually done, and here's a, here's a great example of, and a lot of the front office things, they're, it's actually being broken up. The choice of a lot of the, these companies are, for example, they're picking Salesforce on the front office. So they're doing Salesforce CRM, Salesforce uh, service, commerce, and maybe CPQ yeah. with, with uh, SAP at the back end. And so one of the things that we've used, and here's just one tactic, you know, we've partnered with a company called Dano6. They have a integration piece. So most, most of the times, if you think about any of these integration tools are point to point and you have to integrate, yeah. this actually sits in SAP and sits in Salesforce and already maps on a lot of this mm. work. So it's already pre-mapped. And so the configuration to get some of this data is, is a little bit more straightforward. So Interesting. what we've done is gone live with a front office still pointing to the old mm. ECC. Old back end, yeah. And then yeah. when they upgrade, we then can just do the back end and it's, it's, we don't have to change that front end piece. Um, so... Uh, just digging into this a little bit is, is this kind of like a middle like we we were very familiar with like sligo and Del and boomy um mule soft is it kind of like that but it sounds like it's almost like more of a configuration approach versus this middleware it's, it's layer more of like it so it, it actually they're going to be they're going to have a go to market yeah. with uh, mule soft Mm, right. So okay. it's not an integration platform per se. It's actually, so if I had an integration platform, I would have to build point to point. Yeah. It's a lot of work. People don't realize it's like, yeah, you buy yeah. these tools. They still probably have to pay us like 50 grand or hundred grand to like build out the integration. And just, that's just, you know, MVP or yeah, phase one, you know, <laughs> but, the, but this tool, yeah. this is just one tool. And, and, and some of them, again, we work, we're a big Dell Boomi and uh, MuleSoft partner. So we, we yeah. implement all those. But this is just a, a fast to market. And what they do really interesting, like if you look at SAP, one of the complicated things is, you know, if you want variant data and some of the data, it's not a simple data model. And so what they do is uh, simplify that out so mm. that when it shares the, the yeah, information. It's more normalized. It's yeah, exactly. Yeah. So that way they can. And that's one of the problems in integration. This doesn't. This does it, you know, product one way, and then the other one does product a different way. And it's like, how do you map the two? So basically, right. it simplifies the map. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Would you? So, you know, obviously the big buzzword in 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 commerce is headless, right? I mean, I think we all seen that. And frankly, I think there's a little bit too much buzz around it in some cases where people are, you know, going to it without really understanding what it is and what they're getting and. I also kind of hate the word because it's like, well, everything is technically headless. Everyone's like, oh, we're a headless commerce platform. It's like, well, do you have APIs? Do you have GraphQL? Like technically anything with APIs could be like a headless. The way yeah. people are using the term, it's like anyone with APIs is headless, right? Like it's kind of, but um, I like the, the idea of like, okay, if we really focus on the front end experience, potentially it being headless, it doesn't have to be headless, right? It could be Salesforce or whatever. Um, and then map to the back end while we're working on the back end. And then all we have to do is just kind of wire in a new back end over time. Is that, are you seeing some of that with headless where 
I know you guys work with commerce tools. Is that coming up at all where it's like, all right, let's do some headless work and then we can always upgrade the back ends kind of. Yeah. And, and I think it depends on different industries. There's different propensity to use it and where it works. So I was just at shop talk and I, I literally met with, and I think I got pictures with every headless major CEO. <laughs> <laughs> is this like a is this like gonna be like an instagram like like a collage yeah, actually, that you can do you look at actually <laughs> look up my twitter at the forno p i did funny that you say that i posted it this morning i gotta retweet this right now oh, Hold on. Yeah. Oh, yeah. We, we gotta see this this is great you, you thought i was kidding but you look at look no at no the... i believe you i believe you i just want to see it <laughs> so really um <laughs> so i think They've done a good job. In fact, I was joking with one of the CEOs and I won't name his name, but he was like, because, you know, going back to your point, Tim, I am the old guy, right? Yep. So <laughs> I've now done so many, gone through so many different waves of e-commerce enterprise portals, right? Like, you know, I remember in 2001, when I did my first e-commerce, the big deal was IBM was using EJBs. Oh my right? God. Yeah. Who would who would claim that anymore, right? And then when Hybris came up, they were like, "We were a Spring Framework, you know, it, it it's better than the IBM's and the Oracles, right?" And now headless is the new thing. And he was joking. He's like, <laughs> "In a few years, there will be a new tool, and there'll be something new." And so, in some ways, it, it's some of a marketing, right? But there is a lot of benefit to it, and for different you know, different companies, it's going to allow them to like incrementally upgrade and incrementally be able to, you know, solve problems. But I don't think it, it in itself isn't a magic. It's not, I, the, I, it's not a, a magic bullet, right? Yeah. I do think though, that if you do headless the right way, you can become more agile because we do this component based design and development. You can build things, you can build pieces of the back end over time. And, but there's also a lot of skill that goes into it that you can't underestimate because buying a tool doesn't necessarily solve that knowledge gap. <laughs> you know what I mean? No, like, yeah. There's costs associated with <laughs> yeah. it too, yeah. right? Like the, the cost to support um, headless is more, uh, you know, more expensive than others. And I think part of the issues, and it's funny because there were some postings, like there's very almost religious debates out there right now about don't use the word platform yeah. and oh my well, god yeah I know. how how headless are you right like it i think semantics right i i you know these semantics i mean but i think it just the problem is it confuses people that aren't in the weeds like we are Correct. you know what i mean like the and nuance then, yeah. i mean even you know i'm reading this stuff all the time and the nuances are so you know there's no way any general person at a company is going to be able to keep up with that I think what's more important, that's why we focus on the business outcomes. I agree. Right? When we step back and we say, hey, this is the business outcomes you're really trying to get to and here are different paths to it. That, that's really what we it's, try and focus on. We have on. many oh. non-headless sites that do more revenue than headless sites, right? It's like, mm -hmm. just because you're headless doesn't mean you're going to be a more successful business, right? Like, you know, we're using it for the right use cases where we think there's long-term value for them to go that route and they have the budget or sophistication to handle it right a lot of them have uh, development teams Mo uh, probably half or more than half of our headless customers have development teams like their own engineers yeah. right because uh, and the other half are very certain use cases where you know it kind of makes sense for them or they have the budget or you know um, and, and you know what you just said too about Paul about outcomes. It, it, it really we landed on this in a lot of different episodes too because you know there are a lot of different paths you can take uh, for a lot of different reasons. But you better understand what that end consumer really wants and needs. And it goes back to what you said about sales. I mean, I usually like kind of boil it down to talking about like culture and ecosystems and all this kind of stuff too. Your company just has to have be ready to have these innovation and transformation kind of conversations to understand how you get to a particular outcome right that really is that's really the goal here it's not like 
we must you know be robots and do the following because that's what's hot right now that's the the risk of what isaiah is saying it's like well headless is a trendy term people say i've got to do headless and then it's like well did you really have to do it uh, yeah or what's the business doing? outcome from doing headless versus yeah, not exactly. doing headless like potentially you might have had a better outcome by not doing headless exactly. right and, and one of the things that we do and there's an analogy in b2c it's you know a lot in b2c is you look at all the friction points right and, and especially in the checkout mm -hmm. we try and look at all the friction points in the complex sale process how can we reduce those friction points and those friction points may be technical or they may be process oriented and so we try and look at how to align those but then how do you also align sales incentives so i work with also our sales transformation team that also looks at you know what's your long-term comp plans what are your bonus plans how do you align those so that also so that that's the part that we try and look more holistically in, in some of these larger transformations because really that's what's really going to move the needle combination of that sales strategy the process and then the technology mm -hmm. yeah it's almost like if you don't think through the 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 people in the process, then the technology is irrelevant, right? Because the yeah. technology is just the thing. But if people aren't bought into how to use it and what it's going to do for them, it's 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 basically useless, right? Especially for B2B, where most of the sales aren't going to be sign up and buy without ever like they're probably going to at some point talk to someone or interact with someone. Account somehow. setup, right? Credit yeah. terms, right? Like, you know, for B2B, it's not it's not always simple. But, yeah. you know, there are things that are popping up that are, you know, helping to facilitate and, you know, some great tools that are popping up, like, especially in marketplaces, looking for, you know, there's solutions out there that are popping up like balance for B2B payments, which yeah. I just saw that you became a partner. Yeah, yeah. they're also our sponsor now. I don't, you'll, oh, you'll see it in go. the edited version, they're our newest sponsor. <laughs> so they were smart because they, uh, you know, I like that their mindset was like, look, we just want to be part of this and get the word out and, and educate B2B. And, mm -hmm. you know, they get it and they're kind of, you know, they're just like, how do we help you guys? <laughs> and we're like, <laughs> well, let's get like, you know, let's get the word out because for them, it's like the more people that get more mature in this, the more likely they're going to use balance, right? Because balance is yeah. solving, but it's like they're solving problems that are so awesome that it's almost like if you're not educated at the early stages, you're never going to get to the balance level. You know what I mean? <laughs> no, I, I've, I've, I've met with Bar, the CEO, and, and I've talked to him. That, that's one of the other things I try to do. And what I did was doing at Shop Talk. I'm actually, you, you know, some people don't like to walk the exhibit hall. I spend most of my time there. That's like, all I do. I don't go do. to the... That's what I do. You know, <laughs> unless I'm speaking, I, I go to the... Like, yeah. I don't have the patience to sit through the talks. Like, if I want to watch a YouTube video, I'll watch a YouTube video. But unless it's like, you know, some groundbreaking speaker, you know, I'm probably going to do the exhibit hall. Sorry, get, get continue. I didn't... Yeah, yeah, no, that's... I, I, I'm a geek like that, too. <laughs> um, but, yeah, I mean... Um, Lenovo was one of the best experiences I ever had where we were, you know, early in our growth, we're like, we, you know, we were paying retail for laptops and we're like, this is pretty stupid. So, you know, I was able to get uh, a business Apple account, you know, their discounts are pretty terrible, but technically you get a business discount for Apple unless you're, you know, the discount, it's like the tiers are so small. Like you have to be doing like a billion dollars in Apple sales to get like a, a real discount. But, um, Lenovo, I was able to get a business account fully automated, which was pretty cool. Like I signed up, I put in my like EI number. It wasn't a huge discount, but like programmatically I had a business account that we, uh, that we still use. I think we, we do have like a wrap and so I don't, I think there's something to that to like maybe for the small businesses automating that process and then maybe reaching out to them once they're signed up. But I'm not sure like what some of the barriers are might be for some of these. Do you, have you have you done that at all with any of your customers to figure out like a kind of an automated oh, yeah. SAP program? You might have or... just mentioned one of our clients. But oh, like, Leno Lenovo. That I, I, <laughs> I cannot confirm <laughs> that they're upgrading their B2B experience that we're building. Um, but yeah, I, I think 
it, we see that all the time. Again, uh, it, it's much different when you're 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 getting into kind of we either deal with you know very large co- clients that are selling more industrial that had yeah. been more process centric. It's mm-hmm. very different. It, it's almost like it's it's almost closer to CRM like commerce. It right? is, yeah. And then the when average getting, deal is what, like a hundred grand, two hundred grand. You're talking big deals, right? Yeah, you talk, yeah. You're talking bigger deals, so it's it, it's it's very different than like, you know, we do a lot of like a long tail B two B as well, where it's it's just more of like the use cases that you talked about, yeah. like laptop, new employee, need a new laptop, a new segment. Yeah. yeah, where where we they hadn't served before, they don't have salespeople to serve it. Let's just throw a website out there and drive new revenue. And so they'll go through all of that and they'll have standard terms. Like they just standardize it all. And so like we would, you know, we would be involved in all of those things so, because we'll have regulatory people that can come up with the terms, blah, 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 the payments. And so we'll, we'll set that all up end to end. So do you think that some companies should have both? Uh, Cause my, my philosophy is that um, just from talking to some of our larger customers, especially it's like, you almost need that like somewhat automated self-serve program for the SMB, the people that don't really want to deal with all the headaches of sales reps, and maybe they only need like a small discount anyways, but then they need the enterprise B2B program or whatever that digital assist program, CRM. Do you see like a need for both in a lot of these organizations kind of like, yeah. Everything depending on the <laughs> type of company, right? Like you see every kind of, and, and even if it's high touch, you, you know, and for larger companies, we're doing things such as, hey, we created a web B2B commerce site just for you, like a white mm. label and mm. like very specific to very large customers because, you know, there are customers out there that they're doing a billion dollars just with one customer. Right? Yeah. And so it's so- like, it's worth it to build a personalized yeah. experience just for them. And it's funny you mentioned that our longest standing, most successful B2B commerce com- customer is in promotional products. And what we've developed for them is essentially a systematic approach for them to spin up personalized sites for their customers. That's what we've done over eight years. And they, they went, they went public over uh, uh, yeah. since with that tech as a level above a lot of their competitors. Well, you yeah. know, yeah. It just, and you guys probably both are aware of this, but years ago, the first companies I knew of that did that, uh, were L.L. Bean and Land's End because, you know, L.L. Bean has huge, like, you know, oh, yeah, yeah. whatever businesses and they would spin off sites and the same with Land's End, you know, did that. They originally did, Land's End originally did catalogs, you know, for those specific clients, right? So they do these mini minologs or whatever they called them. They have some funny name for them. And then they start creating sites for each of these, uh, you know, relationships. But you know, it makes so much sense, right? If you've got all that business and it's so critical to what you're up to, you know, on the B2B side, why not, right? I mean, I think it's a great idea. It's it's almost like you need these, all these layers and potential layers and the ability to adapt where it's like, you might have your retail layer, your small business layer. That's like just the, the automated, like the Lenovo version that I was talking about where I could just kind of do it myself. And if I talk to someone, I don't have to, but I can and then you kind of go up the layers of personalization where it could even be their own site for a big customer mm-hmm. um, or some sort of, yeah. One, one thing you I was know. just going to add that you brought up there, just interestingly, you mentioned Land's End. Yep. One of the great talks I did hear, uh, the CEO of Land's End did present at Shop Talk. Mm-hmm. He, did, he did a great job. And one of the things that he talked about, which was super interesting, because a lot of people debate about this was he said, yep. We sell on Amazon and we're doing really well and he's happy with it. Mm-hmm. And, and so I think what you're going to see is a lot <laughs> of fun. vendors looking at lots of distribution. Some people are going to all DTC, but he, w- he was fully committed to we're going to those, those marketplaces and other marketplaces may be out there that we'll continue to partner with. Mm. And, you know, I give them I give them a lot of credit, but I'll tell you something that may or may not be true based on my own personal experience working with Amazon is that if you are looking for like a pair of Lance and khakis on Amazon uh, or, you know, you look for khakis yeah. and you end up on Lance and, you know, Amazon 
works with some lead you know, vendors for all of these different things, even if they're doing their own private label. I had that experience with another client and met with Amazon on it. So they're like, you know, we'll let you be the lead in this, right? So it could be a, this wonderful preferred relationship. Yeah. Uh, you know, because they don't necessarily want to make like a, a million pairs of khaki pants, right? It's not yeah. necessarily. Yeah. I think it, it really depends on what you're selling, right? The more luxury and complex, the probably less likely you're going to want to sell it on Amazon, right? Because, you know, it doesn't make sense to sell a, yeah. you know, $5,000 luxury good on Amazon when you probably need like some sort of, I'm talking D to C, right? Uh, mm -hmm. Or some complex B2B thing probably you're not going to sell on Amazon, but it so, makes sense if Land's End's happy with it and it works yeah, for maybe, maybe so. let's say 80% of SKUs, but my guess is they have some SKUs they might not sell on Amazon. Do you think that's the case or? Oh yeah, it, it's a limited set. It's not their full, but it was just interesting that they, they explicitly called that out. Yeah. I love that. I put, yeah. Paul, you know, I know that we, uh, we have to wrap up soon based on, uh, based yep. on our schedules today. We should make sure that you get uh, kind of a last word in here. So what else should we know about all the exciting things that you're up to or things that our listeners should know? Uh, what else would you like to add? Yeah, uh, follow me on Twitter. I, I like to share. I'm at DeForno P, um, D-O-F-O-R-N-O-P. Um, I, I love to share lots about commerce on there. And I'm going to be keynoting with... Um, the head of commerce at Kellogg's at, at a B2B show it called Envision B2B in June, which is a great show that Digital Commerce 360 is putting on. I'm actually doing a couple presentations there. So mm -hmm. if, if you're interested and you, you guys should definitely come. Uh, I definitely, I'll be around in June. Unfortunately, I'm gone for, uh, one of the reasons I didn't go to shop talk is that I have my wedding coming up and I just didn't want, you know, and I'm going to be gone for a little while, but I'll be back for June. So I'm, I'm eager. I was definitely getting the FOMO of shop talk. So I'm like, I got to get to, to something. So, so where did you say envision, uh, envision? envision BB? It's, it, yeah. It's uh June uh, 9th and 10th, I believe. At where, Chicago? where Chicago. Chicago. Well, that's Chicago. easy for me. That's the yeah. easiest. That's my favorite place to go to for, cause I'm not a big fan flight guy but it's like two hours boom you know sometimes i'll probably like... plan to be there too. so maybe we should do uh maybe we should do a podcast from sure. uh from there, yeah we can know? talk about we can do our product data podcast i think it might be time to get on the road and do that so let's let's talk about that that could be fun yeah right. i will i will definitely be there yeah that's awesome Great. that's excellent that's excellent well, thank you, Paul. Thank you so Thanks, much Paul. for being our guest today. It's uh, great always great to have you. Guys. 